Uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining. And uh, if you're watching this in the far or soon future, uh, welcome uh, to our weekly SAI Nano Chats, where we talk with founders and uh, leaders of nonprofit organizations, initiatives that are working at the intersection between science and society. And uh, we have been um, glad to have various diversity of people that have come in the, on the uh, seminars, uh, discussing what they're doing, what they're not doing, uh, what, the, uh, what challenges they face, and what new ideas they're trying to explore. And I think really this is just a platform for us to have conversations and hear from the ground, essentially, the trenches, if you will, of people that are trying to tackle these really hard problems that are really at the intersection between science and society. And this week, we are super excited to have uh, Peter Volbrecht uh, from Western Michigan University. Uh, and he's also uh, an SAI fellow, really phenomenal individual. I'm super excited he's with us on this journey and uh, looking forward to having a conversation with him to this afternoon. Peter, take it away. All right, thank you very much. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk to you guys a little bit about um, the Brain Explorers program um, that we've been working on. And I'll, I'll put acknowledgements at the end as well, but I couldn't do this on my own. So um, Andy Gall, who's at uh, Hope College, um, Susan Ipri Brown, who's at Hope College and uh, Kirsten Porter Stransky, um, who's here at uh, Western Michigan, have been huge in, in helping put this program together as well. Um, not to mention all the volunteers um, that are required to make this happen. Um, so our program um, is really interested, oh, let's see if I can get this slide to, there we go, um, to thinking about some of these problems. Um, and really the first problem that I've listed here is probably the, the biggest problem um, that we're trying to address or the biggest picture problem that we're trying to address. Um, and that's just like, a, a lack of understanding and uh, appreciation of science within the general public. Um, and how do we improve that understanding? How do we get people to connect with science? And um, where can we do that? And, and we've chosen to do that through K-12 um, outreach events. And we've been focusing on, on neuroscience because that's what the group of us do. Um, but really it's, it's more about understanding and interest in science as a whole through the lens of neuroscience. Um, the other problems that we've got here is basically a need to provide better under, uh, science opportunities for underrepresented and underserved populations in STEM. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in, in a few minutes. Um, but just trying to, again, we've, th there's lots of talk about the pipeline, right? Um, and that we have this this leaky pipeline, um, people are leaving um, science for various reasons. Um, and I think it's much less about getting a lot more people into the pipeline. And I think other people have, have addressed this as well, but it's not so much about getting more people into the pipeline. It's from, it's about keeping people in it um, and keeping people interested in science. And so if we can reach out to some of these underrepresented and underserved populations, especially in kind of this middle school, um, age group, we feel that we may be able to help uh, continue that interest and drive that interest into high school and then hopefully beyond. Um, and so hopefully we cannot lose people from that pipeline. And then finally, um, something that's particularly near and dear to my heart is basically a lack of studies demonstrating effective science outreach. So lots of people are saying that they want to do science outreach. Um, very few of those people are actually assessing their outreach um, events and ha oftentimes they don't have a clear goal for those outreach events. And so um, that's a problem that we've seen and we're trying to address through some of our own outreach um, as well. So uh, the mission of Brain Explorers is to provide exciting, engaging and accessible science engagement for underserved and upper underrepresented populations. Um, we didn't misspell accessible, it, we, we do mean accessible. Um, and again, that ability to actually determine whether or not the outreach that we're doing is effective or not. And that's great, Peter, like the accessibility, right? Because yes. we talk about the accessibility, but I think accessibility yes. is also <laughs> really, really important. I'm glad you have a nuance in there. Definitely. <laughs> um, so how are we addressing this problem? Um, 
we are creating and assessing our neuroscience outreach. Um, and to do that, we're teaming with local schools and getting a whole bunch of uh, volunteers. So this is a picture from, I think a couple years ago now with just a group of our uh, undergraduates from Hope College when I was there um, outside of, a, a, of a Holland um, Middle School, um, Jefferson Middle School. Um, and these are the students who, some of the students who are helping us with this, but teaming with local schools is a critical part of this. Um, it can be challenging as well as you and I mentioned before this started a little bit, um, but it's such a critical piece of it and getting local schools on board um, can be challenging, but is really, really valuable. And once you have them on board, you've got an amazing platform to, to perform your outreach through those schools. Um, so what do we need in order to do this? Um, one of the beauties, in my opinion, of, of our program is that we don't need a lot, um, in, at least in terms of funding. Um, we, need a, we need people, we need lesson plans, we need time to do this, and we need some place to have these events if we're having them um, not in the schools, otherwise that's already taken care of if we're going to the schools and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then, as I mentioned, we do need some funding just to get equipment, um, supplies, uh, particularly consumable supplies like gloves and things like that, um, sheep brains, the likes. Um, so those are the resources that we require. So um, what are we actually doing? So again, as I mentioned, um, I've got collaborators at Hope College and here at, at WMED or Western Michigan School of Medicine. Um, at Hope College, we built a brain awareness week. Um, so we had one week of um, kind of intense activities. Um, this ranged from uh, school visits where we would go visit classrooms and do um, neuroscience outreach there. We also had a um, keynote address, which was more of a community open and community focused um, speaker. So somebody, so some of the examples there, we had somebody come in and, and speak about neuroscience and law, for example, um, and how do these two things um, interact and what can we get out of that in the future? Um, and what, what does that mean for us now? Um, we had somebody come in and speak about the intersection of neuroscience and art. Um, and we had somebody come in and speak about Alzheimer's disease. Um, so, so those are some of the, the ways that we're trying to reach an older audience, I guess. Um, and then we had a brain, um, a brain day. So basically a, a science fair of sorts or a, a, an open house type event um, where individuals could come to Hope College and we had a whole lot of neuroscience related um, activities. I think we had somewhere between 15 and 25 different activities that they could wander around and participate in those activities. Um, at WMED, we've been implementing our Brain Explorers program. Um, ultimately, I think this all will fall under that same Brain Explorers umbrella. Um, we've developed our um, part of this is um, actually built into an undergraduate medical student course called Active Citizenship here at WMED. Um, so we have four students who are receiving credit for um, helping develop lesson plans, go out into um, local schools and do some of these outreach um, events. And then we also have volunteers who um, are getting involved with this program as well. Um, again, getting out into classrooms. And this is much more spread across the entire year as opposed to the Brain Awareness Week at Hope, where it's really focused to one, um, one week of just intense craziness. Um, whereas here, we're spreading it out across the entire um, year. So um, we've been doing this for about three years, going into our fourth year now. Um, our first year, we took some volunteers into K-12 classrooms. Um, we had our Brain Day open house, as I mentioned, and we had our community keynote address. Um, we reached just about 500 community members um, during that first year through these different events. Um, I think we reached, I think we went to about four um, K-12 classrooms that year. Um, in our second year, 
we had uh, more classrooms with a set lesson plan and IRB approval to actually evaluate these um, students. And I'll, I'll show some of that data in a, in a slide here. And then again, had our Brain Day open house. Um, we adjusted our community keynote to try and make it a more accessible topic. Um, so our first one was about Alzheimer's and we had a basic science researcher come and talk about Alzheimer's. And when community members came to that, um, we found that they really wanted to know much more about the clinical side of things and the, the how do I how do I help somebody that I know who has Alzheimer's or um, things like that. And our basic scientist wasn't able to answer those questions to their satisfaction. Um, so we brought in somebody we thought would be able to, to fit more with kind of a community um, topic. That second year, we reached 16 classrooms um, and overall reached about 750 um, community members. This past year, um, we again had IRB approval. Um, this time, we also looked at demographics and content retention in our um, students. We had our Brain Day open house, but again, had approval to evaluate demographics and content retention in this group. Um, we also had our community keynote, which I forgot to put on there. Um, and ultimately, we reached greater than 1,000 people um, in that one week brain, brain awareness week. Um, Currently, we are hoping to continue doing basically all of these things. One thing that jumped out at us that we didn't collect that I think is going to be really valuable in the future is um, looking at uh, socioeconomic status um, and parent education levels to, to understand better access and who is coming to different types of events. Um, and we're hoping to add some sort of an evaluation of our community speaker event how is it effective? What are people getting out of it? Those sorts of things, because we haven't really assessed that up to this point. I think um, that's important, right, uh, Pete, in terms of thinking about who else, what, what is the um, effect, right, the residual right. effect of what you're doing yep. uh, with beyond the students, the, the parents. And I think the parents, actually, by the way, they a the little secret population there, right? Um, yes. uh, I'm trying to look up, uh, find programs that are doing uh, more targeted programming for parents because really the kids will spend the most time with the, with the parents, right? Yes, exactly. And they, they're the best resource right there, but uh, untapped potential, I'd say. But, but yeah, this it's is great a to hard hear. Group, it's a hard group to tap. As, yeah. As is, I would actually say, you know, uh, ninth through 12th grade is also very difficult because they're just so busy and the time yeah. periods where you might have an event outside of their normal class period, uh, at least, is often filled with extracurricular activities. So right. um, we found during our brain day events that we really are hitting more of a K through eight, not a K through 12 audience. Mm, okay. Uh, okay. Because we're just not having students that are in high school attending. Um, not because we didn't ask them to, right? But they're just yeah. not coming. Um, so that's been something that we've been interested in as well. Right. Um, okay. This year, um, We've got this Brain Explorers program that we've kicked off here at WMED. Um, we're looking to get out into the classrooms. We've built it into this active citizenship program. We're also looking to develop um, a longitudinal outreach event. So if we go to a classroom multiple times as opposed to just going once, most people in R1 institutions who do outreach into classrooms are going once, kind of presenting their science and saying, isn't this neat, and then leaving. And that's what we've been doing up to this point as well. Um, we're really curious whether if we were to do this repeatedly, if we went into the classrooms multiple times, once a month, for example, um, would we see a greater effect um, in these students? So that's one of our, our research questions that we're going to be exploring. I think, Peter, the other one too is, um, let's see, you, you can do a one-time event, right? Mm -hmm. One could uh, one could just say, well, is that effect? Let's say you see an effect, right? Um, the question is, how long does it last, right? Yeah. That's a slightly different question to what you just said, where you're saying, could we come back, do it over a longer period? Would that enhance, right? right. And you can still ask the same question and say, okay, we did one session versus four sessions. Would, would, does it last longer when you do four sessions, right? right. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, anyway. it's a, that's a, no, it's a really good question. And it's, yeah. it's one that we... 
are interested in definitely it's, right. it's a little bit harder to agree because of the longitudinal nature of it right it's it's harder yeah. to have access to those students for that long um but it, it's definitely something we're interested in <laughs> right it's, it's, if it's, it's hard if it's not useful five years from now is yeah. what we're doing actually useful so i think it's a really important question yeah um, and, that's, and that's we struggle i think that many organizations and initiatives struggle with that thing. like what impact are we trying to measure and does it last right. and should it last? You know, is it the point that it lasts four years or should it just be that targeted range, right? We want it to last for one year when they're doing X. After that, we have no control, you know, but. Right, well, and that's the other part too, right? <laughs> is is the, ver the, the uncontrollable variable variables. So yeah. if you made an impact and then they go out and continue to seek out these opportunities, you've made an impact in those students and it lasts, but you don't know for sure if, if the bump that you're seeing in science interest is just because of your event or if it's because of subsequent events, which maybe they went to because of your event, you don't know, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah and exactly. So interpretation becomes very difficult as well. Right, <laughs> yeah. that is true. Um, so I mentioned the idea of accessible outreach um, and what we realized after our first year was that we had no idea whether what we were doing was effective or useful. Um, so our first year, we didn't really do any kind of assessment. We just went out into classrooms. We did our brain day thing. We had our community speaker come in and then we were like, so did we do what we wanted to? And we realized we really had no idea, one, for sure what we were wanting to do and two, um, whether we had done it or not. So uh, <laughs> it, that was kind of a wake up moment for us. Um, and, and so we didn't really collect anything useful during that first year. Um, during the second year, we looked at neuroscience content knowledge gains in our students that we met with in mm -hmm. their classroom. Um, and we also evaluated the effects that uh, participating in outreach was having on the undergraduate students who were doing it. Um, oh, okay. I'll show that data in, a, in, I think, on the next slide. Okay. Um, in our third year, we collected demographics data to really understand what types of populations we were hitting with our different types of outreach events. And this is, this is a piece of information that we're currently in the process of publishing, and, and I'm really excited about it. I think it's really, it's not something that is shocking. Um, I think most people who stop and think about it will, will say, yeah, of course but I don't think I've seen data demonstrating it. And so I think this is, this is really interesting um, information that we have here. And then, as I mentioned um, right now, we're, we're trying to um, get socioeconomic status um, and parent education levels so that we can kind of evaluate that um, with both Brain Awareness Week and with our, our Brain Explorers program. Um, for our Brain Explorers program, we're also looking at the effects on medical students and how that may be helpful to them um, in their mm. future careers in terms of just learning how to communicate um, and communicate difficult topics in an uh, in a, in a accessible way. <laughs> um, so those are some of the things that we have done. Um, so that year two, we, we, the first thing we did when we decided we didn't know whether what we were doing was working or not was we decided to assess um, just co uh, content gains. So did students know more after we'd been there about neuroscience than when we, than before we were there? Um, we had them take the same pre and post survey um, once they took it before we showed up in their classroom. Um, and then they took it again seven to 14 days after we were there. So we didn't have mm. them take it while we were there um, at all. We had them take it either before or after. So, um, so it was seven days after the conclusion? After, after the conclusion of our event, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, and so as you can see, um, I guess first on the, on the right, you can see just the to overall effects of outreach on their, their assessment. So the number of correct responses out of 10 um, we went from, you know, roughly five up to about seven on average. Um, so that was, that was good. We were happy with, um, with that change. We saw a significant increase and hopefully that would be the case of pretty much any educational activity, right? Like that hopefully they know more after than, than they did before. Um, so that's not 
crazy. It's, it's good that it happened, but it's not anything wild. Um, we would hope and expect that. Um, what was interesting was when we broke it down more into um, individual questions, and I, I don't have all the questions up, mm -hmm. but we could then start to look at individual questions to understand we thought we were teaching X, but we clearly didn't get that across as well <laughs> as we could have, right? Um, so, so these questions, we then went back and revisited and said, did we really talk about this? And if we didn't, we probably shouldn't be trying to decide whether we taught it or not. And if we thought we were teaching this and we clearly didn't teach it as well as we could, let's revisit how we're approaching it. Um, so this was really valuable for us just in terms of um, continuing to improve the event. Um, the, the most interesting one to me was number four, where we, we saw this you know, possible decrease in, um, it's, it's not statistically significant, but it's the only one where we saw a decrease in, in performance. Um, this it's, 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 by the looks of it, it looks, it's within noise level. Like I, oh, really, I, I, would, I would even call it a decrease. I would just say this is within variance. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely, 100%. Oh. But when we yeah. looked at that question, that's the only true false question that we had. I see. Uh, I see. And so, it, and it's also, if you look at it, it's the highest correct response yeah. out of all of them, yeah. um, even at the be before. Um, and so, Basically, that showed to me, one, that this was a relatively basic concept that most people already knew, and two, that true-false questions are never really a great way of assessing uh, whether people know something or not, because you got a 50-50 shot at it. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's yes, yeah. Did, do, you know, do you remember the question, by the way? I don't remember no, the no. question off the top okay. of my head. I wish I okay. did. I, I should have written okay. it down um, for okay. us. But I it's, it's interesting, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, okay. Yeah. And these, by the way, these are SEMs, right? You know, the SDs? Okay. Yes, SEM. Yep. SEM, okay. I'm just curious about the variability. You know, if you were to plot the individual points in here, what's the distribution um, of the variance? Because um, you're looking at your P, so your power, well, your P.05, right? Right. I'm just curious about that range between the gray and the black. Uh, what's the spread, if you will? Did you see a lot of variance? Is there a lot of variance in these There's things? There's a decent amount of variance. And, yeah. and I mean, we're, we're talking about, in this case, um, we only assessed seventh and eighth grade students that we went into yeah. the classrooms. And seventh and eighth grade students on any given day may or may not want to do your survey. Um, <laughs> so yeah. some, some of the responses, particularly on the next survey that I'll show you guys, um, which had an open-ended question, you get some really interested responses. Yeah, uh, much richer there actually, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, and but sometimes you're like, okay, you clearly just don't care, uh, yeah. and you don't want to be answering my survey, and that's fine, um, that's but we can't toss your answer, so, um, yes. but yeah, so I would say the variability was uh, was reasonably high, um, but, but nothing crazy between pre and post in terms of okay. differences. Okay, okay. So this was interesting. This was a good way for us to kind of assess where can we, where do we have kind of shortcomings in our, in our curriculum where we think we're teaching something and we maybe aren't hitting it as well as we think. Um, and it was also nice just to be affirmed that yes, when we do this, you know, students know, know more than they did when before we were there. Um, we also looked at kind of impact on our, our student volunteers um, and, you know, the some of these questions that we asked out, outreach experience helped me explain concepts to a non-scientist strongly agree to strongly disagree um you know this is a hard skill and it's interesting mm -hmm. seeing students struggle with it um i think many people think that it's easy and then they get out in front of a group of people who know nothing about what you're talking about and they realize very quickly that this is much harder <laughs> um, than they thought. And so this was a, an interesting thing to see that, you know, they, they uh, agree that this is helping them with their science communication skills, particularly with non-scientists. Mm, um, right. And it also, I think another important part of it is that it increased their interest in communicating with non-scientists. This is one of these things where we need, we talk about how society doesn't appreciate or understand science. Um, well, how are they supposed to do that if we don't get out there and actually interact with them and, and teach them about science? Um, right. We can't. And so um, this is great that we're encouraging, hopefully, uh, future scientists and future uh, you know, people involved with science uh, to 
communicate with non-scientists and have that dialogue. Um, so I think that was really important. And then um, just looking at overall communication skills, again, they felt that this was helping their overall ability to communicate um, and communication mm -hmm. skills as a whole. So um, nothing shocking here, um, but I think it was, again, useful and affirming to see that, yes, in fact, the things that we say we're doing, we are. Uh, <laughs> so this is good. This is good. You see the effect. It's like both ways, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, so this is our most, most recent data. So I should have mentioned this is, this is the paper that I think you mentioned to people yeah. was, was available. Um, and so this, has, this paper outlines like our actual um, lesson plan itself, but then also has some of this data in it. So people are, I'm happy to answer any questions people might have about that um, if they want to email me or whatever. Um, this is the most interesting data that we've had recently and we're um, in the process of, of uh, publishing this. So where do we reach a more diverse audience? And it, this is some of that data that I was talking to you about earlier where mm -hmm. it's, it's not shocking when you stop to think about it, but it's very interesting. Um, so we had our brain day open house and we had our, our in school visits. And when you look at this data, it's pretty shocking to see the amount of white and Caucasian individuals that are attending our open house events compared to our, our school visit. And I should say that the school district that we're in is, is um, roughly 50% Hispanic. Um, and I so see. we are missing a huge part of that in our open house and we're getting a lot more of that um, in our school visits. Um, and which one do you do more of? Do you do more open house or more school? We visits? only do one open house. It's a three hour event. Okay. Um, and this last year we did 22 school visits. Um, okay. And okay. So, um, we're able to reach a much more diverse and a lot more students that way, although it's a, it's a lot of work um, to do that. And so this was, this was interesting to us and it, it started to open doors and, and raise questions towards, you know, what are we, what are we accomplishing and, and why are people not coming to our open house that we do get at our school visits? Um, I don't think it's crazy. Um, I think we're probably getting people, and this is where the desire to evaluate socioeconomic status has come in. Um, I would imagine that we're getting um, people of higher socioeconomic status and um, higher parent education levels in our open house participants, and we're probably getting a much more diverse group of people in our school visit um, participants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we don't have the barriers associated with getting to a Saturday morning event, um, and we don't have to have the initial interest in science just to get us there in the first place. Right, um, right. And so I think this was really valuable and, and suggests that if we really want to be reaching those people who um, would otherwise not be reached, uh, we need to be going into the schools as opposed to having events that people might come to um, on a weekend or something like that. Yeah, this is great. I love the title, by the way, you know, uh, <laughs> the working title. <laughs> Are we doing yeah. it right? Are we doing it right? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, and so the other thing that we looked at were science attitudes. Um, and I think this kind of reaffirms what I was just saying. So the attitude scores, this is looking prior to um, the actual event. So before anything happened, who has higher interest in science? Who has more positive attitudes towards science? And we see in our open house um, participants that the attitude scores are significantly higher than our in-school participants. Um, again, these are people who have sought out this opportunity to engage with science as opposed to people who are just having this presented to them. And so it's not shocking, but it's interesting. Um, if we break that down by gender or by uh, race or ethnicity, we don't see any real differences in, in that. Um, mm. Both males and females, the open house attendees were more interested in science than the um, in-school participants. And you'll notice that we only have significance for one group. Um, and that's largely because of our really low ends um, right. for our open house event in particular, where we you know, have two uh, black or African-American individuals. We only have one Asian individual. Um, 
and so we can't really make uh, statistical claims <laughs> because of that. Right, I think it right. also reinforces the fact that um, we are not hitting a very diverse audience uh, when we do our um, open house event compared to um, our in school. So um, again, if we're looking to reach those people who are not science enthusiasts, this reinforces the fact that going to a classroom is a much better place to do that than going to an open house. And I do want to mention that I don't think open houses have no value. Um, like they're great. And I think it's super important to continue to encourage and um, connect people who are science enthusiasts with scientists. I don't think that that's a bad thing, but I think if your goal is to reach those people who are not science enthusiasts, then, then going to schools is a better way to do that than, than having an open house. So this is, comes back to this idea of knowing what your goals are and making sure you're actually meeting them. <laughs> um, it's very important. I mean, I think you should understand what your goals are. And I think right. in your checklist that you that's available also online on our yes. SAI website, but I think the first thing you kind of said was like, what is the goal? What are you trying to do? Because <laughs> exactly. it's easy to just do something, but why are you doing it? Why are you doing it? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a basic question, but important. Very, very yes. important. <laughs> um, so I think this is my last data slide. Um, but so we have basically, where do we have the greatest impact? Um, so looking on the left, we have our attitudes towards science scores and we have our pre and post um, comparisons. Um, noting that our N is really low for our post open house. So we mm -hmm. had to get emails and then sent the survey out via email and we got nine responses, which oh, wow. honestly, we got about a you know 26% response rate, which is actually not terrible in terms of, of an true. online survey response. Um, but with such a low starting end, we don't, it's hard to for sure make uh, any significant claims, but for the sake of argument, we don't really have much of an effect at our open house event on science attitudes. Um, we, you know, we, these people are already excited about science and we don't seem to be changing that much. Um, whereas in the in-school event, we are making a significant impact statistically at least. And this is where one of these things where, is it meaningful? And that's, one yeah. of, that's definitely <laughs> a question that we have, right? Like our attitude scores did go up. It's statistically significant, but was it a meaningful bump and how long will it last? Um, those are some of the questions that we definitely still have. Um, right, right. Because the Bayesian, the Bayesian in me is saying, you know, so the, the change that it is significant in the frequentist style, but if you were to think about it from a Bayesian point of view, what is the degree, right? Uh, right. And to, so you can flip it around and say, what is the actual change, degree of change? And is that something that is probabilistically, right, um, right. in a domain? How is that? So I'm glad you're thinking about this and saying, you know, is it, is it, is it meaningful? <laughs> right, right. You know. so, so we've got the statistics to say that it that it's different, um, but whether that's a meaningful difference, we get right. to figure that out and and figure out a way to uh, figure out a way to figure that out. Right, <laughs> um, right, right. right. And, and I think one of the interesting things would be to look at it like you were saying earlier, kind of longitudinally, right? Like, okay, so we yeah. did this, you know a week later. What if we did it a, a year later? Or do we still see something there or not? And yeah. Uh, or, go, or goes in the opposite direction, right? Which will be right. bad. Uh, because there, <laughs> yes. you know, there are factors you can't control yep. that are going to happen. And this is the really, really hard challenge. Is yeah, <laughs> yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then on the right, we have, we, as I mentioned, we did an open-ended um, open question. Um, so we asked them, I, I, I'm going to paraphrase because I don't remember exactly, but basically, when you touch something hot, what happens? Um, and we asked this question before and after our event. And a lot of our event was based on sensory perception and these sorts of things. Um, yeah. And so um, we had uh, individuals who were blind to whether this was a pre or a post response, um, kind of code these one through five um, or zero through five, I think. Um, and, and in terms of the quality of that response. Um, and so we saw significant increases in the, the quality of that response in our, our post visit. This is for the in-school again, yeah, uh, in-school visit. So again, just kind of reaffirming that yes, when we go in, they come out with more neuroscience ability than when we started. So um, not shocking, but just another way to look at the information. <laughs> you hope that they at least have more, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, 
So kind of what are we hoping to do in the future? Um, continue to develop the WMED Brain Explorers program and, and the Hope College Brain Explorers program as well. Um, we're in the process of creating additional lesson plans so that we have more of a repertoire to, to distribute to people, but also to pull from ourselves. Um, along with that, we're trying to create this longitudinal um, set of lessons so that, and, and ultimately I think it'd be really interesting to try and, and put those out there so that middle school teachers or, or other individuals could use these um, sets of lesson plans. Um, Yay. <laughs> we would like to evaluate the effects of performing um, outreach on our medical students. So, you know, what's the value for them uh, in doing this? And then again, continued assessment of, of the effectiveness of our outreach, um, looking at their uh, assessment of repeated visits effects, um, collection of SES and parent education levels and what that has to do with um, student uh, interest in science um, scores. And then ultimately, you know, I think it'd be really cool um, to continue to grow by recruiting individuals from additional schools. So can we, can we continue to spread this program um, and be kind of a, a, a home base for individuals with, who want to do stuff like this, but don't know where to start. All right. So um, I'd be remiss not to at least show off some of the fun things that we did. This is all from our brain day event where we had permission for pictures. So it's not our actual in class events. Um, but they got to hold a real human brain. We got people um, testing their reflexes using a uh, yardstick. Um, we've got different types of brains. So we've got rat brains and cat brains, um, things like that. We've got um, students playing with um, an a arm that they can control um, with their brain. So they attach electrodes to their own arm. Um, this one's from Backyard Brains. Um, it's a great resource if you're looking to do science, neuroscience outreach stuff. Um, and then we've also just painting brains and coloring brain hats and all sorts of things like that. So um, lots of fun. Um, and as I mentioned, acknowledgments. Um, Andy Gall and Susan Ipri Brown at Hope College have been huge in getting this program up and off the ground. Um, Susan runs all of our um, science camps and things like that. So she's kind of in charge of what's called Explore Hope. So it's kind of our, our um, K-12 science camp type events. She is a wonder of logistics, uh, especially. So she, like, so many things would not have happened without her. Um, and Andy's just been awesome to work with as well in getting this off the ground. Um, since getting here to WMED, um, Dr. Porter Stransky and I have started developing all this stuff together. So um, she's also been incredible. Um, and then this is just a picture again, I think this is actually a, a couple years old at this point, but um, of just our volunteers. So this is just at the brain day. This is a, a, how many student volunteers we had just for our, our brain day event. They didn't get paid. Um, we asked them to pay for their t-shirts, but we would offset it if, uh, if they couldn't handle it. Um, so like these people are here completely for free and some of them paid to be here by paying for a t-shirt. So um, pretty incredible group of people. Um, and that's, that is the primary resource that we have and that we uh, draw from. So, um, and then I put this together for hopefully ease, <laughs> ease of talking um, yeah. and conversation. So. Yes, yes, it's, that's fantastic. Um, thank you for actually having this slide. I think you just read my <laughs> mind completely, right? Um, and so I wanna go directly to the assumptions you're making, right? Yeah. Um, so you write, our, our age friends will have a long-term impact. So you're assuming they'll have a long-term impact and that's something that you're gonna be assessing, right? To right, see yeah, we hope so. <laughs> yeah, can you tell us Amy, any other assumptions that you have uh, that you're, that, you know, cause I think a lot of initiatives have, uh, have a lot of assumptions. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I, I think I think an assumption that I had and that I think is has come to the forefront for me recently is is that I assumed that all schools would want to have us. Um, mm -hmm. and I think that I think that they do, but I think the ease of, of with which you can gain access to them varies significantly based on the school district and things like that. And so I think that would be one assumption that I, I figured, okay, if I go to this school and say, hey, I want to do this thing, they would be like, yes, thanks so much. We would love to have you. Here's everything you need. We 
just want you here. And right. that's not necessarily the case. Um, they've got a lot of stakeholders that they have to uh, um, be it accountable to uh, not just parents, but um, parents, students, scores, time, amount of time that they have for their own curriculum, these sorts of things. And, and naively, I just figured, you know, what's one day, um, but it's a lot. <laughs> so right. That was a big assumption of my own um, that purely came out of me not knowing what I was doing when I started. But you kind of iterated along the way, right? Um, yes. but I think it's this useful framework to start thinking about, okay, I'm assuming X and I'm going there. I'm thinking the problem is X. Actually, the problem is Y, right? And then like you were showing the figure earlier, like you do all those questions and you assess and you're like, whoa, there's, there's no change here or whatever, right? And right. either we are looking at it wrong incorrectly or our assumptions are just wrong, uh, right. period. <laughs> so I think you just have to be humble, you know, really scientific process where right? we kind of right. let the data lead you. Yeah. Right. Because uh, that's sometimes hard way. I'm convinced this is the problem and this is what we're going to do it. And then suddenly um, um, you find yourself um, not available um, to be able to do that. Yeah. So the other part I wanted to assess was to look at your um, outputs, right? And, mm -hmm. and things. I think a lot of organizations do not look at that. What are the lesson plans? Like, what are you producing, right? In this case, you're producing lesson plans. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Publications, volunteer, and people get them confused with outcomes right right and clearly you have differentiated them right <laughs> yeah. um but can you tell us more about you know what is the like these outputs right because ultimately if you produce these lesson plans they'll be produced online right they'll be there that's that's um, our hope is yeah to right be able to to put those out there for people to use um and i, I think as i kind of mentioned so down at the right bottom, got curricula right like, right and, I would love to be able to say, okay, if you want to do a, you know, a set of lessons, uh, yeah. you're a middle school teacher and you find yeah. a resource, mm -hmm. you know, I want to talk about sensory integration or, or sensory processing or something like that. Right. These are the best lessons for you to do. And you would, you do them in this order, right? That right. Taking out, this sounds terrible, taking out as much thinking as possible, right? Like just having it there and ready for people to do um, because people are busy and, developing this stuff as much as we like to think it's really easy if you do it well it's not yeah, um, yeah. which is what we ran into ourselves right our first year right. kind of went into the classroom and said hey science it's fun um <laughs> and, and you know and then by year three we have like okay this is this this these are our learning objectives these are our goals for what we hope students are getting out of this by the time we're done right this hour um you know we need to practice this we need to make sure that you know what you're doing before we get into the classroom these sorts of things. And so I think if we, the, the less thinking that people have to do on the creation side of things, the more they can put into making sure they do it well. Um, right, right, right. However, though, I'm thinking, so the outcomes here, like improved attitude, that's like one central one. But I imagine if with lesson plans out there, if you are indeed increasing um, access in this case uh, to these plans, which otherwise they would not be able to create or don't know where to start, right? Right. Another outcome could be like, hey, are they using them, right? Mm -hmm. How are they using them? And if you see there's an actually an uptick and people suddenly around the country, maybe even the world, begin to use them, that is uh, an outcome, actually. You've produced it as an output. Yeah. And then the outcome is that now you have, you know, 20 schools that are using your, your lesson plan. Now, sure. that would be interesting. Have you thought about that? I haven't thought about that. that. That's why I'm writing it down. <laughs> um, no, I think that'd be really interesting. And I don't know if there's a way to track. Right. And this is where. Who is using our, our information once we get it out there. Um, that would be an interesting thing to try and. Yeah. There's a way to do it. Absolutely. There's a way to do it. And this is, uh, if you have it up, that's why our website is really key to this uh, endeavor, where you can put them up there. You can have, let's say, uh, part of the lesson plan up. And then you ask teachers, hey, are you interested to use this? contact me right uh -huh. and then that way you have a control kind of system in place to say okay i've been contacted in the last month by 20 people and i know how they're using it in their own classroom yeah. right I, so that's another way to to control that lever uh if you will and and so forth so the lesson plan is one thing the volunteer trainings i think that's fantastic uh, uh tracking both the students that are you know, you are impacting the students, but also the volunteer themselves. Mm -hmm. What happens to them over long? Do, do more of them do outreach? Now, of course, you have to test the 
uh, a control sample <laughs> to see that uh, there's no change in those because you never know. Um, but I think don't don't negate your outputs. I think your outputs, uh, are especially the curricula, the lesson plans, even the seminars, if you will, and if you run them. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be interesting to try and figure out a way to mm -hmm. present some of this stuff to say local middle school teachers. Yeah, right? like yeah. Maybe we can't get into your classroom, but right. here's this information. Here's how we think about it. Here's how we think you should present it. That sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think also as low cost system, right? Think about this type of scientist model. If you were to have a bunch of teachers say, hey, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have this online course or seminar I'm gonna host. Mm -hmm and you tune in on this day, whatever, and we'll go over it. Like you walk over, like, this is what I do. This is the, this is the program. This is the lesson plan. This is why we're doing X versus Y, right? Yeah. And yeah, if yeah. you were to run it in your course, I think just a food for thought where you can maximize your impact without having to go and visit 20 different schools. Right. You can have them stay in their own school. You stay in your own place. Yes, it's digital, I get it, but uh, it's a first step. Yeah. To yeah. then say, let me then do this and then go on, on, on site later on. Just food for thought. <laughs> yeah, no, I like, I like it. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and I think, you know, this, this structure for those people who are watching, you know, this is what is called the logic model, uh, your theory of change, right? And I think I like the way Peter has, has it here. You, you're, the, the problem is there. And I think you're always still looking at the problem, trying to understand, am I addressing what I'm, am I addressing the problem? Right. <laughs> and that's something that if you have this visual, visually displayed, you can be like, okay, this is the theory of change. My mission is to do provide this accessible and accessible science. Love it, by the way. <laughs> accessible and accessible science. Uh, science outreach. <laughs> Who do you need? What are you going to be doing? Here's the output. This is something that for all the organization, people who are thinking about doing science outreach, really encourage you to think about creating something like this at the beginning. <laughs> of your programming. Uh, I, I don't know if you did this at the beginning, Peter. No, uh, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> um, because that makes a huge difference where, and it, cause you force you to talk to people and say, so, you know, maybe I'm trying to do this. Does that make sense? And maybe you might realize someone else is doing exactly the same thing. And yeah, you, I mean, you, you just tag along. <laughs> that's been one of the interesting things for me is there's a lot of people doing outreach right like there's yeah a lot of people, there's a lot of people putting ideas out there um for different types of activities and things like this i think one of the things that is lacking mm -hmm. and maybe i'm just not finding it um are, are fully developed lesson plans and curriculum for these types of things like there's lots of activities and it tells you you know if you do this activity these are the things that you can be teaching but it doesn't put together an entire from start to finish like if here's a lesson, here are the learning goals for this lesson. Here's how you can address them through these activities. And so I think that's something that I would love to continue to create and, and find, continue right. to find those people who are doing it and help them centralize a set of lesson plans. Um, and, and if people have other ones, I would love to add them to our repertoire. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and Peter, they, they, they do exist. <laughs> And, and they do exist there. I, I just cannot remember the organization, but um, a former collaborator, they, they do have exactly what you described, these lesson plans, and they have them structured, searchable, and they have them downgraded, like this is for, you know, these grades, yeah. right? And this fits into, for example, the next generation science standards, yes. right? Yeah. And, and they've gone to that level of detail to say, yes. Oh yeah, this is this fits into this model uh, item number four yeah. of NGSS. Yeah, and we've done that with some of ours as well. Oh, great! And then with the, ne the next generation science standards. Um, yeah, and that's something that teachers love. If you can point them towards, look, not only do I want to do something cool and interesting, but it's also meeting some of the goals that have been set for you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Which would then the buy-in makes it easier for them yes. to say, "Oh, cool, we want to do this." Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, but that, that, that's great. That's great. I think this is, um, I, I'm inspired. I'm just thinking this, this is, this is fantastic. And I think as you move forward and grow the program, I, I see utility of this, not just in the U S actually, um, globally, and, you know, there are some neuroscience initiatives in uh, low resource settings that I I've seen, that I know about in Africa, uh, okay. for example, 
um, one of the areas I'm really interested in. And they are doing something really, really hard, right? In a place where there's, there's no, there are no resources, right? Students can't go to the classroom. Right. Right. It does go to the basics, but they can't go to a classroom. So what do you do? Yeah. Right. What do you do? What can you do in that situation? And they're trying to tackle those problems. And, uh, and yeah, I think they're called trends. I forgot the full description, but um, we have done a full analysis, well, not full, but expansive trying to figure out who's doing what in, for example, like in Africa in uh-huh. particular. And uh, we have a list of these on, on a Wikipedia page where we showcase the full distribution of different science outreach initiatives in Africa. Okay. Because uh, our goal is, again, to work with them, collaborate, for example, right? Yeah, that, that would and, be awesome. And, and if they can use some lessons. For, yeah. Like you said, they're very, they're very low cost. And certain things, if you just toss them, aren't losing a ton. Like we do stuff with sheep brains, but probably the biggest cost that we have right because we have to buy them new uh i see i see i see, like I see. everything else is mostly a, a, a one-time upfront cost uh, but if you just didn't do that portion of the lesson plan everything else is pretty cheap and that's what you know i i would love to see this kind of broken down into like a one page or imagine someone who wants to try this in somewhere else you know yeah. uh tanzania let's say yeah. <laughs> and uh uh what would they need what would they need you know and if they don't have X, maybe you can replace it with Y, yeah. right? And, and, and I think that kind of thinking or structure would tend to allow people on the ground to come up with their own modifications mm-hmm. to say, actually, I'm going to do it this way because I can't do that, right? right. Well, my, my population is more specific. So you, you give room for flexibility, right? Right. And creativity. <laughs> yeah. um, and you see it. You, so back to your point here, to, to the output, right? The lesson plan, you, you, you generate X. And later on the way, if you keep in touch with these people, you find out they've actually modified it and they've generated X, you know, 2.0 or something. Yeah, right? yeah. I think that's a huge outcome that it's now catered to a population that is very different, right? Yeah, that's on, a good on point. I like so, that. Um, anyway, uh, Peter, thank you so much. I, I feel like we can keep talking forever, but <laughs> we have to <laughs> wrap at least this first uh, first session, I would say, first uh, chat. And looking forward to a new paper that will come out at some point. Maybe we'll bring you back and chat some more. <laughs> um, cool. um, but, but yeah, thank you so much. Uh, for those of you listening, uh, watching this, keep uh, visiting to our site, SCI Fellow, uh, SCI Nano Chats. Uh, we'll be interviewing and chatting with more founders in the future. And I'm sure Peter will be right back soon. <laughs> awesome. Okay, Peter, right. thank you so much. Thank All right. you. All right, bye. Bye.